Welcome back to Life Unrehearsed. Matt Del Vecchio here, specializing in home care and the senior living industry. My next guest, Joanne Fotiatis, she is at home actually hosting today for her family for Greek Easter, and she squeezed out to join me here on Life Unrehearsed. Well, this coming Tuesday, May 8th, is World Ovarian Cancer Day, and Joanne is an ovarian cancer survivor and proud mother of twin boys. Joanne has also been very much involved in the MUHC Foundation's Dream Big Stop the Silent Killer campaign. Joanne, welcome back to Life Unrehearsed. Thanks for having me, Matt. How are you doing? Doing well. Happy Greek Easter to you and your family. Thank you so much. They're all downstairs. (laughs) You squeezed up. You know, we're dealing with a very serious topic of ovarian cancer, endometrial cancers. But Joanne, first thing, what's on the menu tonight? (laughs) A vegetarian made lamb. Oh, really? Look at that. Very interesting. Well, you know, really, thank you. We talked months ago, and, and as we were approaching Ovarian Cancer Day, I had asked you, and and then as it turns out, it happens to be on Greek uh, uh, Easter, and you graciously to share your very in, in, in inspiring story. So first of all, can you tell us, uh, first, how old you were and when you first found out about your ovarian cancer diagnosis? You're checking how old I am now. Yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was 38 years old, wow. so not technically high risk category. Mm. And then uh, you know, just various tests. Uh, were there some signs? And then all of a sudden, doctors said, like, how did you find out? It, it was very. It was very early. It was um, around this time back in 2015. I was starting to have some very sharp pains in my abdomen, and um, they would come and go. And then it was Lent, it was just before Easter, so that year I had given up coffee. Um, and then when I had started drinking coffee, it just coincided about a month later, so I had to go to the bathroom a lot. Um, and then it was playoff periods with the hockey, and so we would eat the same meal, like following our, our tradition every every game, cheering on our Habs, mm-hmm. and I couldn't finish that meal. I couldn't eat half of it, I couldn't eat quarter of it. I was just really, really full, so really early satiety and um, I was very bloated. I was really tired. I was losing weight, uh, but my stomach was swollen. So um, that's how I was feeling. And Those it, were the preliminary yeah, symptoms. The preliminary signs and, the, and end up getting uh, the diagnosis of ovarian cancer. 38 years old, your life is turned upside down. Uh, now they had to remove this mass and, and you had a whole bunch of things going on in your life at the time as well. So can you quickly describe uh, what, you know, you wanted to have children while all this is going on and, and you advocated hard for yourself. So what was involved in removing the mass and uh, can you sort of share the story of whether you were going to be able to have children or not? Um, well, there, there was surgery involved. It was the good thing is, is as big as it was, it grew from the first ultrasound to surgery, which was three weeks later. Um, it went from ten by twelve centimeters to eighteen by twenty. It was growing really quickly, and the mass was about ten pounds when they removed it. Oh. Um, we were trying to get pregnant when, and that's why I was so in tune with my body. When it was a little off, I went to check it right away. So that's how I got the first ultrasound. I was hoping I was pregnant, but clearly I wasn't. Mm. Unbelievable. 10 pound mass. Listen to Life Unrehearsed. Matt Del Vecchio here, and I'm talking to Joanne Fotiatis as we approach World Ovarian Cancer Day this coming Tuesday, May 8th. Joanne, there was even concern if you could even have children. We'll fast forward a little bit. You ended up getting pregnant with twins, having the mass removed, all this happening so quickly. And let's uh, guess what? We're talking eight, almost nine years ago. How are you doing now? How old are, are the children now? I guess they're close to eight. Is that it? They're seven and a half. Yeah. And I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. The um, The earlier years were definitely very challenging as the outcome could have been very different. It was definitely a very big risk. I did risk my life to get pregnant. Um, and then I had a full hysterectomy as soon as they were born because the one thing we did know was that it was going to come back it was very aggressive so we had to eliminate all possible risks so we knew I had less than an 18 month window that it was Mm going to come back and it could come back at any time so it was very like on a schedule you have to get pregnant by x month um, and then deliver by this time and then hysterectomy 
my goodness, talk about a life unrehearsed, Joanne. And you have been just an incredible advocate uh, and very much involved in the MUHC Foundation's Dream Big Stop the Silent Killer campaign. We're actually going to have Dr. Lucy Gilbert on the show in another month or so. Uh, she was key for your success, and uh, you've been an advocate. Uh, so why is ovarian cancer called the silent killer? That's an excellent question, Matt. Thanks for asking. The The reason why it's called the silent killer is because, as I mentioned, the symptoms are all so subtle. And even when you put them together, like being tired, being bloated, like those are small things. But when you start adding them all together and they persist over a three-week period, it's good to check it out because um, the biggest challenge with ovarian cancer is that about 80% of the cancers are diagnosed in phase three or four. And then the five-year outcome is about 10 to 30%. But if you could catch it in phase one or two, the five-year prognosis is high 80s, 90%. So you really want to catch it early. And that's the problem. Too many people are catching it late, and that's why it's known as a silent killer. Talking with Joanne Fodiatis as we approach World Ovarian Cancer Day this coming Tuesday, May 8th. As you heard, uh, Joanne had ovarian cancer. She's a survivor, a real fighter uh, for yourself. I guess that's part of it, early detection if you can. So what would you? What else could you advise to women to help prevent ovarian or endometrial cancers? There's nothing you can do to prevent it. Even if you're genetically predisposed, I had no high-risk factors and it still happened. So Put that out of your mind that it can't happen to you. It doesn't always happen to the neighbor. As soon as you feel something, if it's more than three weeks, um, go check it out. Worst case scenario, it's nothing, but you want to be safe. You don't want to wait till it's too late. So really be in tune. And if a doctor dismisses you, find a second doctor. You want to be sure because a lot of us get dismissed because we're considered young and not medically predisposed, genetically predisposed, and um if I would have listened to the first author who saw me, I wouldn't be here today, most likely. It's so true. You've mentioned this before. You were dismissed, just like you're saying, and you knew your body was telling you, no, I, I've got to dig a little deeper here, and thank goodness you did. Um, I've mentioned Dr. Lucy Gilbert. We have just about a, a minute or so here, Joanne, but um, she literally was a lifesaver for you, and can you just share a little bit of the, the work she's doing today to help future uh, women today and tomorrow. So Dr. Lucy, as my boys call her, I, I definitely owe her my life. And one of my boys, uh, his name is Lucas. He's named after her. So <laughs> uh, we talk about her all the time in this house. Um, and she is um, the first person to come out with uh, an early detection test for ovarian cancer. Now, there has been no change in the outcome of ovarian cancer for over 50 years. <laughs> And when you think of the PAP test that um, is for um, cervical cancer, when that first came out, cervical cancer was the second leading death of women at the time. And now that you have the PAP test and you could have early detection, it's almost a non-issue. It's like moved down the list to like 16 or 17. But there is no early detection for ovarian cancer. So this um, this test that Dr. Gilbert and her incredible team has developed is like an advanced pap smear pretty much um and once that becomes ca uh, standard care then you could have that early detection and catch it early so that you have a good chance of surviving the five years and, and exactly like you were saying joanne so you're not detecting it at the latter stages you're really getting at it beforehand and uh, you know that research is ongoing raising a lot of funds uh, and and donations uh, for the cause and uh, it is and, and i must say this is world leading this just isn't a montreal thing right joanne this is this is she's it's at world state of leading and it just happens to be in our backyard by my doctor so i am over the moon to be co-chairing this campaign and I can't wait for it to become standard care. If people want to donate, where should we go? Go to the Dovey website. Uh, just Google MUHC Dovey Gene Test and you'll, and you'll find it. Dovey, D-O-V-E-E -E, for detecting ovarian and endometrial cancers early. So that's Dovey, D-O-V-E-E -E, Gene Test on the MUHC website. Joanne, really do appreciate you taking a little time. I hear the kids in the background. Sounds like there's some a big party going on. Uh, thank you for spreading the good word um, and wish you continued success, continued health, and enjoy your uh, Easter supper. Thank you so much, Matt.
All Thanks right. for having me. Thank you, Joanne. That's Joanne Fodiatis, ovarian cancer survivor, proud mom of twin boys, and a leading advocate for the prevention of ovarian and endometrial cancers.